It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Christopher Corman. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm fine, Douglas. How are you? Good morning. Happy New Year to you and your family. Happy New Year to you. Thank you for coming on the show. Nice it's my pleasure. You. So I guess right off the bat, we've got to tell people that you are the son of the late Harvey Corman. Um, yes. You have to be at least, I think, what, 40 years old <laughs> to perhaps remember <laughs> who <laughs> your father was? <laughs> Yeah, um, it's funny about his, his his demographic. If you cover the Carol Burnett show, or you cover Mel Brooks, or for those who are animation fans, he was the voice of the Great Gazoo on the Flintstones. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Okay, wow. So his brand is so generational, it, it's really hard to believe. That depends on what age person you group you ta- tap into. If you mentioned Blazing Saddles, they know him. He mentioned the Burnett show, more with women than men. But if you mention the Flintstones, it's like, oh my God, who knew that? Well, most people didn't know that because he only did like 13 episodes. So it wasn't like he was a major character, but the Great Kazoo has caught a, almost a cult following. And that even shocked him. I hadn't even thought about the Great Kazoo until you mentioned that. But then... As a kid, I remember he was one of the ones I liked. He was one of the more interesting characters. Him and Pebbles. I was always into yeah. Pebbles, you know. And I just loved the way she talked because she didn't say anything. She went, you know, and I love that. I thought, oh, that's perfect. You know, sort of like the teacher on Charlie Brown when yes. you know, just kind of wah, 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 wah. And right. But, I mean, in the more serious point of it is that it got the communication across to what you wanted to do. You know, it, what words weren't necessary. No, but it's funny, when he did them, he wasn't given a whole lot of direction from Hannah or Barbera. So he didn't really know what to do with it. So he said, well, I'll just do this very effete, British, cockney, or uh, uh, arrogant voice. Some people liked it, Douglas. Some people found it annoying. But... Um, you know, when he went around the country for Hannah Barbera, uh, signing all those cells, all those cartoon cells, he was finding a whole new audience that had, were like, oh my God, Harvey, we didn't know you were the Great Kazoo. And he signed them, and he was going all over the country, and he was meeting people, <laughs> young, old, middle-aged, going, oh God, we remember you from the Burnett, we remember you from Blaze and Sounds, but oh my God, you, you were the voice of the Great Kazoo. And then all of a sudden, kids were getting excited about meeting him, and that just... That really just humbled him. The cartoon world has that far-reaching connection with people. He never really knew there was an audience for that, the way the way it is, or the way it was for him. So he was just, I think he was always very flattered when anyone recognized his work. He was very, 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 very humbled man, Douglas, to tell you the truth. Well, one so, of the things that I found interesting about your book, I did read through it, and I, I'm happy that you wrote it in the way that you did. Where I got through it in about an hour. Because I generally wow. don't have time to read people's books. I get a lot of authors on this show. I bet you do. And, you know, I just, unfortunately, I can't take the time to read a 400-page book. <laughs> I, I just don't have the time, right? And it's not really Who necessary. Does? It's not really necessary for me to read the book to do the interview. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of the PR people send the books and I've got stacks yes. of books, and then finally I just told them, look, don't, don't send the books, please. If you want to send one, <laughs> you, can, you can send an e-book, you know, that's fine, but I just have right. way too many. The reason that I feel like I don't need to read the book isn't because I don't want to, but it's because if we sit there and dissect the book chapter by chapter during the podcast, after the podcast is finished, anybody listening to that isn't going to want to buy the book because they feel like they've already read it. Right. What I want to do with my show is give people sort of a, like a movie trailer version of the book. Right. So you just yes. give them enough 
and then say, oh, I got to go out and get that book. Because, I mean, obviously the whole point of people coming on to promote their books is they want to sell them. So I don't, I don't tend to read people's books. But yours I did because it just went so fast because of the way that you wrote it. Well, thank you, Douglas. That means a lot to me. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was good. It was entertaining. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I pulled a couple of points that I'll cover here in a minute. Uh, that I wanted to ask you about from the book. A couple of funny things. Sure. In, in Blazing Saddles, because it's been a long time since I've seen that movie, but I remember your father's character. It was Hedy Lamar or something like that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Hedy Lamar actually sued Mel and Warner Brothers for $50,000 for using her name. Okay, well, I'm curious why he picked that. Was it just the joke of using somebody else's yes. name? Yeah. Mel wrote the joke. I don't see he originally for those who love back the stories he had originally had the story as called Black Bart and he had offered the heavy heavy Lamar role to Gene Wilder and Gene couldn't do it or didn't want to do it. he didn't think the character was right for him then supposedly from what my dad says and from other people have said he offered it to Carl Reiner I asked Mel at my father's memorial is that true and Mel said, well, as usual, your father's full of you-know-what. I never offered that role. Anne Bancroft had seen your father on the Burnett Show, Chris. And Anne came to me and said, you should use the guy from the Burnett Show. And Dad and Mel had never worked together. Carl and my dad had known each other. But we did, he didn't know what kind of chemistry Mel and my dad was going to have. So it, it, it's a, a crapshoot. So the first day, the, the first scene is the paddle tennis day. That was the first scene with Mel, was the paddle and my dad was so scared to work with Mel because he revered Mel and Carl Reiner and the 2,000-year-old man. And my dad was so scared to work with Mel. Not, not in a bad way, but he, you know, he, had, he revered Mel. And I tell you, Douglas, I don't think anybody could have anticipated the kind of chemistry Mel and my dad was going to have. They just really loved working together. And, you know, you can't... It's a lightning in a bottle. I mean, you know, Carl and Mel are so associated with each other. So when dad did the... Blazing Saddles, no one knew it was going to be a landmark film when they made it in 74. Who knows when you make a movie like that, when it's going to, when it's appealed, it's going to be, you know, 50 years later. Well, it's like a cult film so, now. Yeah, it is, but you couldn't make it now. Oh, God, no. <laughs> you could never no. make that film now. Uh uh-uh. uh. Or the producers. Um, you certainly can do the producers now either. Although they did do a remake of it with Matthew Broderick and... Uh, yeah, Nathan it wasn't Lane. the same. Yeah, it wasn't quite. I agree. But for sure they couldn't do Blazing Saddle just because of the N-word flying in there all the time oh, and all the racist sort of humor. This has kind of ruined comedy because no one can make fun of anybody anymore. It's, uh, if you say a bad thing, I'm going to sue you. If you say a bad thing, I'm going to sue you. No one has a sense of humor about themselves anymore. No, comedy... And that's really a shame. Comedy is, is almost dead. I had a guest on who did a documentary that's kind of interesting. It's called Can We Take a Joke? And he had a lot of people. Adam Carolla, uh, Lisa Lampanelli, uh, Penn Uh Gillette, a whole bunch of comedians. And uh, Gilbert Godfrey, the late Gilbert Godfrey. And it was, they were talking about how back in the day, it was sort of revolving around Lenny Bruce was the sort of central theme of the movie and they were talking about how back in the Lenny's day that he was constantly getting arrested for you know quote unquote obscenity on stage right but his sort of safe haven was the college campuses because in the 60s yeah the college campuses loved him and he was always welcome there and always got a standing ovation whenever he played there blah 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 and the whole thing has come so full circle where college campuses are like the worst places for comedians to go yeah. these days. And there was one reference where it said Jerry Seinfeld, who is the most benign comedian I've ever heard, he won't go to college campuses. <laughs> oh, that's saying a lot. You know, so it's like if he won't go, God, who else isn't going to go? Nobody's going to go. No, but, you know, you don't, we don't have satirists or like humorists like Mort Saul anymore. I mean, uh, Robert Klein is about the only one that's left that does. But Marcel's gone. Uh, Dick Sean's gone. Shelley Berman is gone. 
Um, Shelley and my dad went to Goodman Theater together, so I knew Shelley. But no one's doing observational comedy. No one's doing political humor. I mean, Dick Gregory said the N word in his show, but Richard Pryor said it oh, in his show. Yeah, I mean, Richard Pryor do. couldn't do what he did now. No, no. Right. and it, it's sad. And Mel said it himself. Political correctness is ruining comedy. Because I mean, he couldn't, like I said, he couldn't do the producers. Or I mean, it's amazing that uh, they tried All in the Family again with Woody Harrelson and uh, Marissa Tomei. They tried the Jeffersons again. I don't know if there's if there's a landscape for that kind of humor. You can't say those things anymore. You can't say what Archie Bunker said on television, even though the point of the whole thing was normally it was showing just how absurd and how stupid racism is. Right. People weren't getting the point. He wasn't saying it to, to hurt anybody. He was saying it to, to show the shock value that these words hurt. Well, exactly. Are hurt. But I think also all in the fan. I, I'm sad that they're doing remakes of those shows because all in, the, all in the Family and the Jeffersons were a product of their time. And right. to do it, you know, what, 50 years later almost? No, no, it, it just doesn't work. They, they were right for their moment in time. Right. But leave it alone, you know? Yes. <laughs> if you want to go back and reminisce, you've got all the old DVDs. You can watch the show as it was meant to be. Uh, but no. Yeah, don't remake. I wouldn't even bother to see it. Well, I mean, there's, I talk to comedians, actors all the time. There are no more Larry Gelbards anymore. We lost, we just lost Norman Lear. We don't have people writing situational comedy like they used to because everything is so caught up with the with the laugh track that you don't have people uh, are as uh, cerebral as a as, as a Larry Gelbart or Norman Lear. We don't have you know where Diane English go. Where did Linda T- Bloodworth Thomas go with that designing women? All that kind of writing is gone, and I don't know why. It just it's hard to find, and it's hard to find great sketch comedians, or, or I mean, like my dad, Carol. Um, there are no more Dean Martins. There yeah. are no more yeah. Laffins, um, because people are not writing seven to ten minute sketches anymore, or maybe Saturday Night Live is, but it's always about bashing Trump. So. Again, the landscape of comedy, sketch comedy, certainly variety, is dead, which is really sad, Douglas, if you think about it. Oh, I think it is. Speaking of dead, you had mentioned everybody who has passed away recently. Mel Brooks is still alive. Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke is still alive. Yeah. Carol is still kicking it. And it's, it's, I mean, if you think about the, uh, thank God for me TV. Thank God for streaming. Thank God for Pluto TV. You know, when I wrote the book two and a half, three years ago, I thought, I don't know what the landscape of my book is going to mean anything. And Carol started doing her one-woman show. And then she, she made a deal with MeTV and then Pluto. And all of a sudden, my book had some legs again because people were still talking about the Burnett show. And this is you know, even post-COVID. So my book had some meaning again. Other than that, I don't know what, where my book would have gone. Is she uh, still working, was, Carol? She did... Um, she did a couple of episodes of um, Better Call Saul with oh, uh, Bob okay. Odenkirk. Okay. She did a few, but at, I think Carol's 96 or 97. Oh, wow. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if she has to work. I think she does it because I think performers, if they don't work, uh, part of them dies. There's a part of that artistic part of them that um, starts to wane, and they need that, that fire they still have that fire inside them to want to perform. And, 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 and even to say this, this sounds funny, Douglas, but they are always looking to find how to become better, hone their craft. Um, I don't think you get ever too old to hone your craft. And I think my father and Carol were always finding the next thing to get better. And um, So I think at her age, I think she just works because she loves working with other people that love what they do. I don't think she has to. I think she just does what she wants to. Oh, well, that's great. And I've always been a big fan of Carol. I, I think she's a fantastic person. Me too. Person. Yeah. Personally and professionally, I, I, I adore that woman beyond. Um, I, can't, I can't begin to say the blessings that the Carol Burnett show has given me in my lifetime. The friendships I've made through that show. The people I got to meet because of that show. Um, it's. I tell Jody Hamilton, Carol's daughter, all the time. You have no idea what the Carol Burnett show has done for all our lives. Everyone who's associated with the show, it's, it gives off one blessing to another to me daily. And that's, 
that's a real legacy for me for the Burnett Show are the people I've got to meet and engage because of that show. It's as old as I am. I'm as old as the Burnett Show. I'm 56 years old. That's how old the Burnett Show is, 56 years old. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so, I, I mean, guess I'm a I little would, older than you, because I, I would, uh, if you were born in 67, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I was, was born born in 62, yeah, so, born, all right, I'm five years older than you. But we're still of the same generation. It. Well, you don't sound it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, some days I feel it. Believe me. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes I feel 102. Yeah. Um, um, let me, let's kind of hone in on your book a little bit because okay. uh, we're kind of running down on time. So your book is called, Oh My God, It's Harvey Corman's Son, OMG. And right. the one thing I found interesting about your father was that he started out really wanting to be a serious dramatic actor. Yeah. And then yes. now that he's gone, I think his most famous, or he is most famous for the Carol Burnett Show, probably. Carol Burnett's on Blazing Saddles are his, or yeah, or his his work with Carol, Carol and his work with Mel. Um, some people do know that he did some Pink Panther movies. He did two two Pink Panther movies, but yeah, his work with Mel and Carol are probably what people associate my dad with Carol and Mel. It's yeah. him probably more than anybody. Because um, he was he was he on was, that show from the beginning to the end, wasn't he? No, he left actually the, after the tenth year. Um, Carol. Carol, Carol stopped the show, and then somehow ABC said, we'll pick it up. And she did a hybrid set, 11th season, and she didn't do as many shows. She had Steve Lawrence, and she had Ken Berry, and Dick Van Dyke, and other people on. Uh, Dick, Dick was on the last season for from September to December that he left the show because he just didn't feel comfortable doing the show because they were basically giving him rehashed material that they'd given my father to do. And that's not Dick's. That's not Dick's forte. And he felt uncomfortable. They, they were they were winding down. But uh, my dad went off and did tried his his own shows, and he found out what a lot of people could found out. Like McLean Stevenson is a good friend, and Tim found out they weren't stars, Douglas. They were good character actors. They were great sketch artists. They were great supporting actors. And I don't mean to be that say that in a demeaning way, but. My dad wasn't Gleason, he wasn't Jack Benny, he wasn't Carol, he wasn't John Ritter. They had that certain something that drew, drew you to them. But there were certain things about my father that was appealing. He just wasn't a star star like Carol, like Gleason, like Benny, you know. Right. But uh, he went to Goodman Theater. He studied, you know, Shakespeare. He studied with Uta Hagen. He studied with Herbert Burgoff. I mean, his idol was Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> there and, you go. You know, it was funny when I was reading through the book and I, that part about where your father wanted to be a, uh, a serious dramatic actor and he ended up being probably most famous for, like you said, Blazing Saddles and Carol Burnett. I thought of uh, Maurice Evans, who was a oh, Shakespearean yeah. actor, but is probably most famous for being Elizabeth Montgomery's father on Bewitched. Yes. So it, it, it's it, funny it how... Become, yeah, well, that, that's a very good actually parallel because yeah. so many actors become, almost they come to resent their success in one medium because they get pigeonholed or typecast. And it was sort of like, uh, John Ritter, uh, you're Jack Tripper, Larry Hagman, you're J.R. Ewing, Harvey Korn, uh, you're Mel Brooks, you're Carol Burnett. And my dad said, I'm more than that. I mean, he did a Shakespeare show back in 58 and Betty Davis and Charles Lawton came backstage, and they lauded my father as the next Olivier. And that was very touching to my father. And then when he got to meet his idol, you know, they had to peel my father off the carpet because he couldn't believe that Lawrence Olivier, that Lawrence Olivier came backstage to the Burnett Show. And, they, and my dad had no idea he was there. Nobody knew. And Lawrence said, oh, Harvey, I've been a big fan of yours for years. And my dad couldn't believe his idol knew who he was. Oh, that's great. Because my dad just saw himself as, and you know the pecking order of this industry, Douglas, is really funny. It's theater, movies, television, and how they see legitimate acting. So what he considered, what he was doing in sketch comedy was, oh, I'm not equal to those other performers like Cary Grant on all these, and Burt Lancaster and all these big movie people. I'm not equal to them, you know? Well, I think even back in the 60s when we were talking about Bewitched, 
I know Agnes Moorhead had real reservations about going on that show because they felt television was a big step down from where yeah. they were previously. But they gained a whole new audience. I mean, I saw an interview with Katherine Hepburn on Dick Cavett, and she said that this was the first time she would really had come on television, that she had resisted it because she thought it was beneath her to go on television. Yeah, it's, well, if you look at all the people who did, who did not do The Tonight Show for that reason, was you, you never saw Cary Grant. I don't think you ever saw Cary Grant and certain actors on The Tonight Show because they didn't want people to think, oh, God, they're not articulate. They're not smart enough. They're not bright enough to engage Johnny one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And yet Jimmy Stewart was on The Tonight Show. Oh, many A times. lot of big stars were on. Yeah. So I think people, certain performers didn't want people to think, oh, God, you know, they're so boring as people. You know, Jack Lemmon went on The Tonight Show. I mean, so many great people. And a lot of people who they were on The Tonight Show, either Johnny knew already, and so there was a comfort level. And speaking of my favorite people, Jack Lemmon was one of, my, one of the dearest people in the whole world. To me, personally, um, I adored that man beyond words. Yeah, it's really, um, my dad always kind of resented that he got pigeonholed as, and don't get me wrong, he loves Meryl, he loves Carol, he loves Tim, but he always felt like he got pigeonholed as just, oh, you're, you're that guy from the sketch show, you're, you're in your blazing cells, you're, you know. And he could do more than that, but the casting people in the industry didn't see him that way. So I think that's his only lasting if he had a resentment, if, if any, it was that he didn't get a chance to stretch his legs and become a dramatic actor. It, it's uh, funny like that, too, because another one, you know, I mentioned Maurice Evans, but another one uh, that we were talking about, the show All in the Family, was Carol O'Connor. You want to talk about getting pigeonholed. Yeah. I mean, nobody, oh <laughs> nobody could look at him and even say, hi, Carol. It was uh, Archie. He became Archie. Right. Right. Well, you think about it, Mickey Rooney was originally up for that role. Oh, really? And I didn't know that. Mickey, oh, yeah. yeah, Mickey wasn't going to touch that role because uh, he knew that would have killed his career. And yet, you know, Carol went on to do in the, in, in the Heat of the Night, but he tried to get away from the Archie role. You know, John Ritter with Bruce Company. If you think about it, Billy Crystal was up for that role. If you flip-flop John Ritter and Billy Crystal, you put John Ritter on soap and you put Billy Crystal on Bruce Company, I don't think it's the same show. No, I don't think so. Although John Ritter did go on to do, like, I thought he was brilliant in um, Sling Blade. Oh, he's wonderful in Sling Blade. Yeah. So um, that haircut was just brilliant. I mean. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, John and my, John's second, first wife, Dancy Ritter, is a dear friends of mine, and um, they did Love Boat together. My dad and John worked together quite a few times in their life, and John and my dad were very, very close friends, and I miss John so much. Um, yeah, he died, the most great. died rather young, unfortunately. Very young, very young. And he had so much more of a life to live, and he had so much. He was just one of those guys that you cheered for. You didn't resent his success. You cheered him on. You know, I said, I'm so close friends with his first wife, Nancy Ritter. And we talk about John, my dad, a lot. And, you know, I become friends with ha uh, Howard Murray, Jan Murray's son. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And uh, Karen Knotts, Don Knotts's daughter, and Lisa Hackett, Buddy Hackett's daughter. And, you know, we, it's funny, in all the years we were, our fathers were alive, we never met. I never met Lisa Hackett. I never got to meet these people's siblings, but we, we, we correspond on Facebook. The whole genesis of the book, really, which is kind of funny, is when pre-COVID was, the point of the book was, my, and my wife said it best, is you should celebrate the father and the husband in correlation with who he was as the artist. So people saw him as more of a complete person, a more a relatable person. So you should weave the stories in between show business and who he was as a father, and he was an advocate for my learning disability, because that was going to be a more attractive approach to the book than just telling fallacious stories, which I wasn't going to do, because everybody does that, Douglas, that if I humanized him more, it would be more relatable, and I could go out there in the public and do speaking opportunities and talk and share what he meant to me as an advocate for my own disability, instead of just talking about Carol and Mel and Tim and all the time. And I don't mind talking about that, but that's not who he was. I wanted a more balanced interpretation of who he was. Well, I think you got it, so, because that's what I picked up from you. the book, was this real sort of 
personal insight. And like you said, you wove in the his career in there as well. And and I liked how it was from your perspective. I liked how there were some parts in there about you going backstage at the Tonight Show when he was on that. And I mean, those kind of stories are interesting to me. And uh, let me pick up on one of them that uh, I th- okay. thought was funny. <laughs> you you had mentioned something about your father in a tiny Honda. Now I'm looking at that, <laughs> thinking that that was like the 1970s Honda Civic, which was a real oh piece of shit car. They're they're much better now. Honda Civics are great cars yeah. now. But back in the 70s, I remember there were these little hatchback things. They weighed about yeah. 150 pounds. You could pick them up and, and move them into a parallel parking spot. And they weren't terribly safe. It was like riding around in a, a beer can, basically. Pretty much. Yeah. So is that the kind of Honda that he had? He had, oh my God, it's almost embarrassing to, to admit to it. He had a little red four-door with the sunroof. And, and it was a hatchback, right? Was, it was a hatchback. hatchback. Yeah, was, okay, was, I know the one. Yeah. Totally makes me laugh because he's six two and a half, six three, and he would have to lay down and heave himself into the car just to get in. <laughs> and trying to watch Douglas trying to watch somebody six three get into a car is just it was like watching a Conway routine. And he would have to flip his body around just to get into his seat. Now I'm six three myself, so I, I know what that's. Uh, but he thought Douglas, if he drove a red Honda. No one would recognize him because no one's expected to see Harvey in a red Honda. Oh, I see. Because he was always he was always afraid of being stalked by somebody, so he would drive around in this little red Honda all the time, and people weren't expecting that, so they wouldn't think that was him, so they would leave him alone. Well, I suppose there was logic to that. If he had pulled up in a big Cadillac, uh, right? Then yeah, okay. Well, I get it. But uh, poor man had to suffer like that to squeeze himself well, into that tiny little well, can. Like he, yeah, well, he finally graduated to driving the Lexus, which was a little bit better. Oh, considerably. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Considerably, yeah. But, um, you know, I when I wrote the book, and I'm glad you said it was it was a fast read and an interesting read because I didn't want it to be long. It was only 165 pages. And um, I wanted it to be where I want people to say, oh, God, you sh- what about this story? What about that story? And like, and I'm like, I couldn't, fill, I couldn't fit it all in. You know, that whole idea of wanting more, leave them wanting more. You know, it's like I had to leave certain things out because I didn't, it didn't appeal to me in the sense of it didn't fit in with the structure of the book. It would seem like I was name dropping. And Trish said, don't put it in then. Try to put in stories that are people are going to relate to him. So I really have to owe my wife the bulk of the credit for the book because she was the brains behind it. Uh, the last name I want to throw out, and then we've got to wind this down is uh, Tim Conway. And I know there's been a lot of talk on various shows and comparatives about when your father and Tim worked together on The Burnett Show and how they used to break character. There were people who criticized that. I know Lauren Michaels did. And he said, you know, I don't want that on on SNL. But then, uh, you know, when he did, um, oh, Stefan, uh, what's his name? Bill Hader. And he yeah. broke character every single time he did Stefan. But it was funny. Right. You know, but my going back to your to your father and Tim, and, and this is nothing against them. It's just an observation that I had. No. When when you had a comedy team historic, uh, Abbott and Costello, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Uh, right. Uh, Laurel and Hardy. I mean, the list goes on. You had one guy who was the straight guy, one guy who was the loony. Right. That that was the setup, right. right? Right. When your father and Tim got together, I always felt like they couldn't decide who was who. <laughs> like, oh, am I the loony this time, or are you the loony? Or they kept switching parts in mid-skit, and it got a little confusing for me because I was like, wait a minute. You know, and then when they would break character, because, and I always thought the reason that they broke character was because they couldn't figure out who was going to do the straight bit and who was doing the loony bit. That was just my observation. I think it's funny you say that because Bob Newhart tagged them. Harvey was a tall, serious straight man, and Tim was a short, serious straight man. Okay. <laughs> and Bob's not Bob's not wrong. Um, the problem with and I'm, I'm not going to bash Tim because I don't bash dead people. But 
Tim never did the same show twice. He did. They did the first show, the dress show, at five thirty. They got everything in the can. The second show was always for Tim and Harvey. Tim could do whatever he wanted to Harvey. So the second show was a free for all. Now, personally, there are a lot of people who said the breaking up was a relatable quality that made Tim and my dad more enjoyable to watch. My father absolutely hated breaking up because he classified himself or considered himself a very serious performer because you're there to serve the written word. And the idea of breaking up is unprofessional and breaking the fourth wall is unprofessional. And he never broke up intentionally. I can tell you that for now. For sure. He never liked breaking up. But people, if he did break up, it's because he thought it would make the show more relatable to the audience. And then in the public, it made him and Tim more relatable as people. If there's only rede- one redeeming quality that breaking up had, Douglas, it was it did make them more relatable. Otherwise, my dad hated it. Because he worked with Lucy, he worked with Benny, he worked with Skelton, he worked with a lot of performers and who were very serious about their craft of comedy. And he really honored that as a performer, that you're there to serve the written word. You're not there to indulge your own ego. Right. So he never really liked the breaking up part. And I hope that doesn't hurt anybody's, I hope that doesn't hurt anyone's interpretation of my father. Because a lot, so many people on Facebook that listen tell me a lot of great things about work watching that show was because your dad and Jim broke up. And I, I have to cringe because I don't want to tell them he hated it. But I have to be honest with them and say he did hate it. But does he consider himself a very serious performer that was very disciplined? And it, it really gnawed at him that people thought he was not disciplined. Was it Lucy who said comedy is serious business? Was that her quote? Yeah. 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 It, and, um, you know, if, and he worked with Lucy God knows how many times where he, he really learned the, the art of, the, the you know, comedy is, is a precision art art form. If you're just a little bit off, you can get hurt. So she was very dedicated to the physical aspect of comedy. You can't fluff it off. It's not it, comedy is a very precision like discipline. Oh yeah. Lucy took it very seriously. And I think you either got it or you don't. I, I think that that timing, that comedic timing, is something that people are just kind of born with. I I, I think it's difficult to learn that if you don't have it sort of ingrained in you already. I've always thought about that, Douglas. I don't know if it's, I, don't, I, I, I think, I guess you can hone it depending on, you know, if you work, if you're doing three camera, you're doing a, an audience show, you get immediate response from the audience if something is working. But when you're doing one camera, you don't know if it's working or not. You're, how, how long do you know to hold for a laugh on a one camera? Um, when you're doing live, tel- live theater, like Tim and my dad did, they toured together for 10 years together, live, doing live theater. You got that immediate response from the audience. But you're doing one camera. How, do you, how, how long do you know to hold for a laugh? How do you know if the audience at home is going to get it? So my dad always preferred doing live theater. He didn't like doing one, one camera television. He hated it, actually. But uh, he was up for the love boat role. A lot of people don't know that. He almost got the Meryl Stupid role. Oh, uh, Gavin McLeod's role? Yeah, he was. Oh, okay. Dad had done the TV movie. Now, the Burnett show was in its last year. Lobo was going on. And uh, Douglas Kramer and Aaron Sorkin pulled my dad in and said, Would you consider the, the, uh, the Meryl Stupid role? My dad said, Like, I just came off 10 years on the Burnett show. I just spent four years on Danny Kay. I had 14 years of steady work. I just want to enjoy my time with my son and my daughter. I have an older sister, Maria. And we want to go to ball games and, you know, travel. But. He said, well, I'm very flattered that you thought you thought of me. But as he was walking out, he said, i got to admit this to you guys. My rear end would have been perfect for those captain shorts. I had a great <laughs> you-know-what. Uh, that's good. That's but I cleaned good. that up because I didn't want to say the A word on your show. Oh, well, that's all um, right. It doesn't matter. Uh, but, uh, anyways, Chris, you know, we do have to wind this down, I'm sorry to say. Okay. Uh, the book is called, Oh, My God, It's Harvey Coleman's Son. The book is out... It was released in 2020, right? Yes. Okay. Give out a website. Do you have a website for the book? Uh, you can go to www.bearmanourmanor press, or you can go on Amazon.com okay. and, and look it up. And it's on it's on Kindle, and hopefully it'll be on audio soon. You can find it on eBay as well. Um, on eBay, okay. You can buy it on eBay or Amazon.com or BearManor.com. Okay. Um, and if young know, people want to go to my um, doctor, I, my dad did a movie called Doc. Oh my God, 
It's based on a true story. It's like an airplane movie. And my dad's character was Doctor of My Ear. So you can imagine how many jokes they got out of that <laughs> joke. Doctor of My Ear. So I named a website called Doctor of My Ear. And it's a tribute page to my father on Facebook. And they can go to Facebook and find me. It's called Doctor of My Ear uh, fan page. And I post stories about my father and videos of my father's best work. But it's basically a site for people who love pulp culture, Douglas. The Lost Art of Laughing, da uh, Danny Kaye, Dean Martin, Laughing, just pop culture. I, I, I cover music on there. Um, and it's just a ch chance for people who never got to meet my father to engage me and ask me questions and talk to me about the Burnett Show and Blazing Saddles and feel like they have a chance to connect with my father through me, and that's why I have the page. Okay, great. Well, listen, Chris, this was a lot of fun talking to you. I know we could have gone. It was a lot of fun to you, Douglas. But uh, best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. You too. Thank you, Douglas, and thank you for having me on your show.